and welcome to the Center County Historical Society's online lecture series. I'm Mary Sorensen, uh, director, and I thank you all for attending today's presentation. I know you're going to enjoy it. A few items and updates before we begin. Um, I'm going to be letting people in here while we're going. Um, first of all, we ask that you keep your audio off um, to avoid background noise and and you can open your chat box and type in questions as we're going along throughout the program and they'll be shared when the program is finished. After Mr. Fergus has had a chance to address these questions, you're welcome to unmute your audio and add, add, ask any additional questions at that time. Um, we are thrilled to report that the replacement of the Center Furnace Mansion's roof and restoration of the, its historic por porches will begin tomorrow. This is the first phase of the mansion's restoration and it's being generously funded in part through the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission's Keystone Preservation Grant, the Hamer Foundation, the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau's Tourism Grant, private donations and professional services donated by board member and restoration architect, Alan Popovich with AP Architects and roof consultant, Bill Markham of MarTech Associates, Inc. And if you're interested in how you can help or would like to know more about this, I invite you to give me a call at 814-234-4779. While our office will be open throughout the, the construction, the mansion will remain closed for tours until later this summer. A couple of, uh, a couple of upcoming events that we have going on. Um, on Saturday, May 8th from nine to two, we're pleased to be bringing back our outdoor plant celebration fundraiser this year. You can expect safety precautions such as face masks and physical distancing required. And of course, plenty of wonderful plant offerings by Center Furnace Mansion Gardeners and a number of nurseries and businesses. You can visit the Center County Historical Society's website at centerhistory.org for vendor information and updates about that. And then on Sunday, June 6th at two o'clock PM, we have another interesting virtual program, a common canvas, Pennsylvania's post office murals by David Lembeck. Based on the 2008 exhibition presented by the State Museum of Pennsylvania, a common canvas was created to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal. A common canvas is the result of research and documentation by co-curator David Lembeck and photographer Michael McManski. When mounted at the State Museum, the exhibit featured over 50 examples of murals and sculptures created for Pennsylvania's post offices between 1934 and 1943. A link will be provided on centerhistory.org about a week prior to the event. Today's program is part of the Hensley Pyle Distinguished Author Series and is coordinated by Dr. Ford Risley, our CCHS Board of Governors member and Associate Dean for Undergraduate and Graduate Education in the College of Communications at Penn State. Ford will introduce Mr. Um, Fergus today. And with that, Ford, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Charles Fergus, author of Nighthawk's Wing. Uh, the book is the second Gideon Stoltz mystery book set in Pennsylvania in the Jacksonian era of the 1830s. Both books feature a young Pennsylvania uh, German sheriff trying to solve uh, crimes in clannish Scots-Irish community in the central Pennsylvania backcountry. Charles is the author of 20 books, including The Wingless Crow, Natural Pennsylvania, and Making a Home for Wildlife. Many of his books are about nature and wildlife. His deep knowledge of the natural world informs his fiction, letting him invoke a strong sense of place. Charles was born and raised in central Pennsylvania. He's a graduate of Penn State's writing program and has worked as a writer and editor uh, for his entire career. Uh, he lived in this area for many years, uh, but now resides on an old farm in Northern Vermont with his wife, the author, Nancy Marie Brown. As, uh, excuse me, as, as uh, Mary said, today's program is part of the Distinguished Lecture Series that is underwritten by the Ann Hamilton Hensey Pyle and Kenneth B. Pyle Educational Fund for Regional Heritage Preservation. 
The inspiration for the fund uh, include the interest that Anne and Kenneth have in the history of the community in which they grew up and their belief in the value of studying history. Uh, today's uh, format is, uh, is, is different uh, than, than previous, uh, many of the previous talks uh, in that I'm gonna ask Charles uh, uh, questions and uh, invite you all to, uh, to join us uh, uh, later. Uh, so, uh, so please uh, uh, keep in mind uh, and, and ask any questions that you may have for, uh, for Charles. So uh, uh, again, welcome Charles. Thanks so much for being here. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, so maybe uh, for the, the folks who haven't read uh, uh, Nighthawk's Wings, can you describe uh, briefly the, the plot? Well, sure. Um, my main character is a young sheriff of Pennsylvania German extraction. His name is Gideon Stoltz, and he lives in a fictional town and county in central Pennsylvania in the 1830s. And in this particular mystery, A Nighthawk's Wing, he must investigate the murder of a woman whose badly decomposed body turns up in a sinkhole. And uh, folks in the Pennsylvania Dutch farming community where she lived call her a witch. Gideon is suffering from a head injury after a fall off his horse. He can't remember anything from the time of the woman's death. As flashes of memory return to him though, uh, he realizes that not only did he know the woman, he was with her uh, the night before she died. So why do you, uh, so why do you like to, uh, why did you choose to, to uh, you know, to uh, central Pennsylvania as the, as the, is the place for your uh, th these these novels? Well, I grew up in central Pennsylvania. I was born in Belfont. Um, I lived for many years uh, in State College in um, the area near Tussieville, um, near Port Matilda, and I'm just very used to and and I guess I would say steeped in the topography and the nature and even the culture of central Pennsylvania. You know, it's my home. It's the place that I know most deeply uh, in the world. And so it was, it was really natural for me to want to set a, a mystery here, set a novel here. Um, I've spent many, many days out in nature doing research for my nonfiction uh, nature books, um, riding horses, hunting, looking for old charcoal hearths in, in the forest. Um, you know, I just really love the Ridge and Valley topography of central Pennsylvania and I come back often. So this place, I would say your place uh, is in my blood too. That's great. Uh, what kind of things did you learn while, uh, while researching the book? Well, I learned a lot of, um, I, I, you know, that's the thing with historical fiction. You really want to, you have a story and the story rules the, 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 the work. Um, the story propels the work. And, but at the same time, since it's historical fiction, you have a chance to make people aware of a different time, a different time, a different place in this case, uh, you know, in the case of a reader who wouldn't live in central Pennsylvania. Um, so I've done a lot of research into politics, you know, everything from politics and to burial practices, to um, cultural beliefs, to beliefs in witchcraft and, and supernatural aspects in trying to present a picture of this fictional county. And, you know, I, I, should, I should actually read something in the front of it's in the front of Nighthawk's wing. I saw it the other day and it, it spoke to me in a way. And it says here, this is a work of fiction, names, places, characters, and incidents are either the products of the imagina author's imagination or are used fictitiously. And that's true. Um, but having said that, uh, the places are, are a little more than just uh, 
products of my imagination because I really did draw on my uh, memories and my experiences in central Pennsylvania when uh, trying to bring a sense of verisimilitude, you know, in, um, to these to these two mystery mystery novels. This is a kind of a big question, but what what are some of your your biggest uh, I would or perhaps uh, most important memories of of living in this area? Oh wow, that's a um, that's a question I hadn't prepared for, but um, I would say one of my deepest memories is, and it's an ongoing, uh, it was an ongoing experience because I went there many times, was visiting places like Alan Seeger Natural Area. And that place is, is quite amazing um, because especially, and it's especially pertinent for my understanding of central Pennsylvania in the 1830s, because it probably doesn't look a whole lot different now than it would have looked when my mysteries are taking place. Um, I, I went to, I was taken to Ellen Seeger by my parents, probably in the uh, mid to late 1950s for the first time. And I visited there. Every time I come back to Pennsylvania, I, I spend time at Alan Seeger. Um, it's a touchstone place for me. So I would say that the, the memories of some of the natural places in the county are, are really important to me. So uh, in terms of the book, uh, which took place first, uh, the plot, the, the character, the, the setting? In the case of Nighthawk's Wing, I had my main character, and that's uh, Sheriff Gideon Stoltz. Um, in the setting, again, uh, it's, it's a, it's, the book is a sequel to a, a first novel in the series called A Stranger Here Below. So the setting really existed uh, as well. And so it was, a, it was more a matter of figuring out what would be a good plot for a mystery. And um, I remember reading in Henry David Thoreau's journals. It's not something I do very often because Henry David Thoreau is not the most readable author in the world, in my opinion. Um, but Thoreau, uh, in his journal, recorded the, the death of a neighbor of his. And in this case, uh, they had to take the coffin to the body because the man lived by himself and he had been out rambling and he had died and his body had decomposed. And so rather than take the body to the coffin, uh, the people who found his body or his friends had to take the coffin to the body. And it got me wondering, what would an 1830s sheriff need to do to investigate um, what becomes obvious uh, as, as being a homicide? when he's uh, confronted with a body in an advanced state of decomposition. Uh, what, what were some of the, uh, the challenges you, know, you faced in, in, in writing a, a novel like this? Well, plotting is always a real challenge in writing mysteries. Um, you know, you, you know the, in a way, Mysteries are, are, are pretty much hero stories, and, and we've had them in our, our culture for forever, really, probably since humans sat around campfires or in the mouths of big caves. Um, you know, they're really compelling stories. Uh, but having said that, you have to devise a plot. You know, you have to have uh, a story that has profluence that moves forward and that makes the reader want to keep turning pages. And honestly, that's why I like mysteries and thrillers because they, you know, they don't do a lot of navel gazing, I guess you could say. Things happen on the page. And so you, they make you want to continue to read. Um, so that was a challenge. You know, it's always a challenge to come up with a, a believable, compelling plot. Um, Another challenge in the case of, of these mysteries for me is that I, uh, I have a 
um, a bit of a history. And some of the people who are here, and, and I see some of my friends here, and I want to say uh, hi. And I see a, a, actually one of my brothers is, is sitting in here too. Um, but I do have a, um, some experience with evil and with uh, murder because uh, my mother was murdered in 1995. And in writing these mysteries, I determined that one of the things that I wanted to do was to honestly depict the human phenomenon of murder. Um, so many books uh, and mysteries in particular kind of glossed over the truly monumental horror of murder. And that's something that I want to do. I was, you know, there's a, there's a whole genre of mysteries called cozies. And I, do, I don't read them because uh, to me, they're just not realistic about um, what murder means, what murder is like. And I think that, I think it's important to, um, you know, to really be honest about uh, about the phenomenon, and so I would say that was one of one of the greater challenges in writing both of these mysteries. Do you have favorite mystery uh, writers or people that you've long admired and tried to pattern your work after? I do, yeah, um, and I'm old enough that I need to write these things down so that I don't forget them at the spur of the moment. So I'm going to look at a few here. Um, right now I'm reading a lot of Michael Connolly mysteries. He has, uh, his main character is Harry Bosch, who is a very compelling uh, detective. Uh, this, that's it. They're relatively contemporary novels set in Los Angeles. Um, Karen Fossum is a Norwegian novelist who's quite wonderful. Uh, I love Walter Mosley's post-World War II mysteries, which are also set in Los Angeles. Uh, Peter Robinson's DSI Alan Banks uh, mysteries set in London. Um, just for fun, The Ladies' Number One Detective Agency by Alexander McCall Smith. Really a lovely novels. Um, in terms of historical mysteries, the Inspector Yashim series set in 1830s Turkey by Jason Goodwin and his main character is a eunuch. So you, you get to uh, look at a very different slice of life when you're reading the, uh, the Yashim, Inspector Yashim mysteries. So those are, those are a few. Good. James Lee Burke, James Lee Burke too. I should mention him. He's so good at presenting um, landscape and weather and nature and uh, he doesn't shrink from writing about truly evil and violent characters. Yeah, I'm a big fan of James Lee Burke myself. Uh, you employ a lot of symbolism in, in Nighthawk's Wings. Can you talk about that and, and uh, uh, why you needed uh, the, those symbols? Well, first of all, the title Nighthawk's Wing tells you that the bird Nighthawk uh, is an important aspect of the story. And in fact, it is a symbol. Um, the, the story of the person who is the murder victim in this novel is actually told in a series of flashbacks. And the woman is not a, a stable person. She is um, first introduced to the reader when she is an inmate of the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, which is a real penitentiary. It was created in the, it was built in the uh, late 1820s and early 1830s. So it was brand new in 1836 when uh, Nighthawk's Wing is set. And her name is Rebecca Kreidler and Rebecca is visited by a Nighthawk in her cell, which is not possible. Uh, not realistic. And uh, as her story is, is revealed, you come to see that the Nighthawk symbolizes an unborn child that Rebecca lost following an attack by an abusive husband. And as, as the novel 
proceeds, uh, the Nighthawk kind of becomes a, a symbol of Rebecca's own um, tormented soul. And the Nighthawk persists in the story even after Rebecca dies. And again, that's in a, one of a number of flashbacks. So you have a sense of, of the course of her life, which has been a difficult life. And then the Nighthawk really um, embodies uh, that difficulty for Rebecca. I mean, Nighthawks are really great birds. And I can remember when I was, when I was a kid um, in state college and, and into my teenage years too, seeing many, many Nighthawks because Penn State has all these big flat gravel roofs on buildings. And those are ideal habitats for Nighthawks to use uh, for nesting. And so walking around the town, mostly the downtown in State College during the evening in summer and early autumn, you would see flocks of Nighthawks up above the buildings and they dip and dart and they have, they have really interesting uh, wings. They have long tapered wings with a, with a kind of a crook in them. And then there's a white mark on each wing. So you can see these markings flashing in the, in the dusk. Um, so the, the Nighthawk is a, is a pretty striking bird. And, um, and then I was fortunate enough to find a John James Audubon painting that was available for use on the, the cover. So we have a, a Nighthawk on the cover now. Yeah, for those of us who don't know anything about Nighthawks, what makes them different from, uh, you know, um, most other hawks? <laughs> well, they're not actually hawks, for one thing. They're very closely related to whippoorwills. Um, they're in a class of birds called night jars. The whippoorwills, uh, night hawks, Chuck Wills widows. These are crepuscular birds. That means they're active at dusk, um, and they they are insectivores. So rather than eating birds or or uh, rodents or small mammals, as most other hawks do, they dart around and dip and and stunt in the air and they. Um, take insects, insect prey out of the air. They are a very spooky bird. So, and it's interesting because the, the novel originally was not called Nighthawk's Wing. It had a different title, um, but uh, because the Nighthawk was so prevalent and, and the symbolism was so important in the book, my editor said, can you come up with a title that includes uh, the word Nighthawk? And so we worked on that and Nighthawk's wing was what we what we ended up with. Uh, was there anything new that you discovered uh, or that surprised you as, as you researched and, and, and wrote the book? I would say that one one thing that really st that stuck out to me was the prevalence of a belief of beliefs in witchcraft and the supernatural in the 1830s. And um, there's a book called The Long Lost Friend, which was published in Reading, Pennsylvania in, 19, in 1820. And it is a uh, collection of um, spells and curses. In, it was originally published in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania. Well, it was actually originally published in High German, not Pennsylvania German, because Pennsylvania German or Pennsylvanisch Deutsch is actually a spoken dialect and not a written uh, not a written language. Um, so I, I incorporated in the novel uh, a, uh, a spell from um, this, this old 1820s book, uh, uh, The Long Lost Friend. And um, the, you know, Rebecca also, the, the victim of, of the murder in the book is believed to be a witch. So I would say that that was one of the aspects of, of doing the research for the novel that was uh, enjoyable to me and surprising. And that was finding out uh, the extent to which people of, of, of various cultures did believe in um, the supernatural at that time. And, you know, the, my main character is um, Pennsylvania German, Pennsylvania Dutch, but he's married to a woman who is uh, of Scotch-Irish descent. And of course, central Pennsylvania had uh, a great 
many people from both of those two cultures uh, settling it. And the first settlers tended to be um, Scotch Irish or Lowland Scots and, um, and some English. And then Pennsylvania Germans came in a bit later. Um, Pennsylvania Germans were attracted to Pennsylvania most often, often because of the um, religious freedom that was granted uh, by William Penn and the Quakers who had founded the colony. But as time passed, they moved uh, farther west. And so they intermingled with the, uh, the Scotch-Irish in central Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, today I don't think we really uh, make a whole lot of, you know, take a whole lot of notice as to whether our last name is Schreckengast, like my college roommate who I can see in the audience today. Hi, Earl. Um, or Fergus, which is a, uh, a Scotch-Irish name. Good. Well, uh, I have uh, uh, more questions for, for Charles, but if anybody has questions they would like to ask, uh, you know, it's a bit awkward via Zoom, but if you want to uh, raise your hand <laughs> or, or type them into the, uh, the chat, uh, we'll, we'll ask them. So uh, uh, but maybe while you're thinking of questions, uh, I'll, I'll, ask a, I'll, I'll ask a few more. Well, you know, one, one thing we could do for it, sure. um, I, could, uh, I could actually read, do a reading. Okay. And then people could consider what they might want to discuss while I'm doing that. That sounds great. Okay. Please do that. Uh, I mentioned that one of the characters, an important character in the book is um, Rebecca Kreidler. And, you know, one of the things that this book does is it examines the status of women in the 1830s. And uh, things could be very tough for women back then because there were many strictures on what they could and couldn't do. Um, for instance, a woman could not own property. If she were married, it automatically became uh, the property of her husband. And women could legally be corporally punished by their husbands too. So um, Rebecca Kreidler is a, is a key character through flashbacks, but another woman character, important character is uh, Gideon Stoltz's wife, True. Her name is True Burns. That was her um, maiden name. So she's True Burns Stoltz. And what I'd like to, to do is to um, read a passage where about True, and to set the scene, True is um, staying in, she, she and Gideon have been estranged, mostly because she has been deeply depressed following the death of their young child, which took place in the first Gideon Stoltz mystery, A Stranger Here Below. So True has actually gone off on her own and is staying with her grandmother, her Graham, Graham Burns, and Graham Burns lives in the Panther Valley, uh, which is not dissimilar, let's say, from the Bald Eagle Valley. And uh, True has the really the unwelcome power of uh, second sight. And it's a, that's a phenomenon that, that, you know, shouldn't be completely discounted. And in fact, it was a pretty strong phenomenon in the Scotch-Irish culture. Uh, as it happens, True, True's grandmother, Graham Burns, also has a second sight. So True is, is staying in Graham Burns' cabin in the Panther Valley. And she's been estranged from Gideon. Gideon has come and visited her there, but he's not there right now. He has gone away uh, investigating this, this murder. And so he has gone into a, a valley to the east of uh, Adamant, which is the name that I've chosen for the, uh, for the county seat of Coleraine County, fictional Coleraine County. So let me read to you about True in her grandmother's cabin. True came suddenly awake. She heard wings fluttering in the darkness, a bird trapped inside the cabin, frantically beating its wings to get out. She rose from her bed and searched. She found nothing. All she could hear was her gram snoring. Maybe that was what had wakened her. As she stood in the darkness, 
The cabin's walls seemed to press inward and a powerful choking sensation overcame her. She saw Gideon. He lay on his back in a closed in place, a dark place, one without any light, yet she could see him. He was bound hand and foot, his eyes open and staring. She feared he might be dead. Then he blinked. He thrashed about, struggled against the ropes binding him. Then he seemed to give up. He lay back down and heaved a sigh, his shoulders sagging, his head coming to rest in the dirt, the dirt floor of a cave. The vision vanished like smoke from a dying fire. True could breathe again. She stood there panting, blood pounding in her temples. A dream? A waking dream? No, it was real. She had seen him. She had seen Gideon. It was the second sight, like the time her grandmother had seen her husband, Ezekiel, fall off his horse and lie bleeding on the ground with the pack horses running all around him, had viewed the thing in great clarity over many intervening miles. True hurried to her gram's bed and shook the old woman awake. I saw Gideon. He's in a cave. He could die. The old woman coughed and sat up. I have to help him, True said. If you think so, Graham Burns said. True tugged on her grandmother's bony arm. Get up, Graham. You have to come with me. The old woman gently freed herself from True's hand. What time of night is it? Graham Burns did not own a clock. The inside of the cabin was almost black. True found her way to the door and went out. The only light she could see came from a sinking sliver of moon and a thousand thousand stars. She hurried back inside, went to her gram, still in bed. We need to get ready. Sell yourself, child, the old woman said. Tell me what you saw. True described her vision of Gideon lying bound on the floor of a cave. Panic rose in her breast. Come with me, Graham, help him. This is for you to do. We'll hitch Jack to your wagon. That wagon ain't been off the farm in years. The harness is mouse chewed and worthless. Where do you think that cave is? In Sinking Valley, he must be there. The place where he was trying to solve that crime. You rode here on that jack horse, Graham Burns said. Put a saddle on him and go. I've never been to that place, nor have I. Come with me, please. I'd be of no use. I'd just slow you down. The old woman eased out of bed, straightened and rubbed her lower back. Let me round up some clothes for you. Go saddle Jack. I'll put together some things for you to take along. She hobbled in her night dress to the small window and peered out. Get moving. You can be ready by daybreak. As the sky brightened in the east, Graham Burns tied to the back of True's saddle a drawstring poke containing bread, jerked venison, cheese, a tinderbox, some tow, a candle, a small lantern, a knife, and a leather sheath. She had given True a dented, broad-brimmed hat and made her put on a pair of her grandfather Ezekiel's musty old trousers, blue stripes on white ticking cloth. They might look odd and scarcely proper, but those pants will help you ride and get off and on Jack when the need arises. Graham Burns had True tighten the saddle's girth and set the bit in the horse's mouth. Jack is a good horse, she said, stroking his nose, but he's lazy. I'll cut you a switch. True mounted and Graham Burns handed her a sassafras switch. The black gelding showed white around his eyes and took a big leap forward. True grabbed his mane and held on tight with her legs. Slow down, Jack, slow down. Jack seized the bit and tossed his head from side to side. It scared True, and she almost threw herself off the horse's back, but she thought about Gideon in his plight. She had to reach him. Not knowing what else to do, she brought the switch down smartly on the gelding's shoulder, was surprised when he did not buck her off or explode into a headlong gallop, but instead made a big circle, then took off down the road in a jouncing trot. True didn't dare turn around and call goodbye to her gram. At the bottom of the hollow, she turned up Panther Valley. That's great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple questions. Uh, can you tell us the, uh, the real names of uh, some of the fictional locations? 
the real names of the fictional locations. Well, let's see. Um, anybody know where Curtin Village is? I'm sure you do. Uh, that was the that was the site of the ironworks in the first Gideon Stoltz mystery, The Stranger Here Below. And the Panther Valley is very similar to the valley uh, where I lived for many years, uh, the Bald Eagle Valley. And, you know, I, I found a, a really wonderful resource. Um, and it's called, the, has anyone heard of the... Uh, the Mellish maps of Pennsylvania. These were, these were county maps that were created in uh, around 1820 by a man named John Mellish, who was a Scottish uh, cartographer. And he made a map of every county that existed at that time in Pennsylvania under contract from the Pennsylvania legislature. And um, the Mellish maps, there is a map for Center County. At that time, Center County was actually larger than it is now. It included part of what is now Clinton County. Um, but I relied on that map actually for a lot of, uh, you know, to, to get a sense of what Center County would have been like in the 1830s. Um, roughly 10% of the land, for instance, was actually cleared at that time, according to the Mellish map. It's got a great legend, you know, that talks about what percentage of the land is is um, able to be cultivated and, and what percentage is cleared and, you know, what what lands are, are poor lands, you know, what percentage of lands are poor lands. And then it talks about places like the plains. And this is a, you know, it appears on the map and I'm looking at the map and I'm saying, oh, the plains. Well, that's the barrens. So there are a number of, of places in Center County that I describe, you know, to a greater or lesser degree of accuracy. Um, for instance, the Sinking Valley that was referred to in the reading that I just did, this is a landlocked valley to the south and east of the county seat of Adamant. Um, and it's not dissimilar to uh, Sugar Valley which is a, a place where I know at least one person here who's in the audience knows about in depth. And that would be my college roommate, Earl. Um, Adamant, the town of Adamant has a, a big spring that supplies uh, the town's water and, and supplies the power for mills and sawmills and uh, various other industries. Um, that's probably sounds pretty familiar to folks too. So, and the name Adamant was actually something that I saw on a map of Vermont and I said, you know, that's too good not to steal. So, uh, so we have a question from Earl. Uh, can you talk more about the, the research that, that went into, uh, you know, this and, and your other uh, historical novel? I, I would, I've read dozens of books, let's put it that way. Um, and those books range from everything from, you know, biography of, of uh, Andrew Jackson to uh, descriptions of what day-to-day -day life was like in the first half of the 19th century. Um, right now, for instance, I'm, I've begun doing research for the fourth Gideon Stoltz mystery. And so I'm reading about the Panic of 1837, which was a, the country's first real depression. Um, I'm doing research into counterfeiting because counterfeiting, believe it or not, was a huge uh, contributor of currency for this country because in the early 1800s, we didn't have any gold. Nobody had discovered gold in the United States. Um, and so uh, specie, gold and silver coin, was mostly uh, actually Spanish and Portuguese money. Um, the third Gideon Stoltz mystery, which I'm almost finished with, I almost have a draft finished, deals with um, runaway slaves. And so I've done a lot of research into uh, the federal slave laws uh, and also a, uh, a personal protection act that was passed in Pennsylvania in 1826, which actually um, made it very difficult for a Southern slave owner to come into Pennsylvania and uh, claim and take away um, a person of color who had run 
from slavery. Um, I've read, of course, a lot in Lynn's history of Center County. And interestingly enough, there, there are references in there to slave hunters and runaway slaves. In fact, uh, Judge Burnside, who was a judge right around the same time when, um, uh, when my mysteries are set, he actually, um, he, actually, he actually ruled in one case of two fugitive slaves who had been captured that the Federal Fugitive Slave Act of, I think it was eight, uh, 1797, took precedence over Pennsylvania's uh, personal liberty law, and he turned the slaves over to the slave hunters. So lots of research, you know, just, uh, and it, it, it's, it's a fascinating era. And I, I think the, the early 1800s, in a way, are a mirror on our uh, our world today and our country today, because many of the same issues were were huge. You know, it was the you know the um, suffrage, who has the right to vote, um, prison reform. Um, you know what what uh, uh, the politics was anything but but collegial at that time. It was really quite divided uh, between Whigs uh, and Democrats. Um, you know, financial problems, uh, immigration was a huge issue. So it's a fascinating era and I would urge anyone who, who's interested to do some reading because you'll, you'll find out some really interesting facts. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, two of the children, uh, excuse me, two of the women had children die. Uh, was there some significance to that? Well, I will say that um, the death of children was a much more common uh, happening in the early 1800s than it is today. Um, this was before uh, medicine knew of germ theory. So um, a family could, could lose all of its children in the course of three or four days to dysentery in the summer, for instance, you know, a bacterial infection of the uh, intestines. So uh, losing children was not really uncommon in the early 1800s. And in the case of my main character's wife, True, who is becoming, I would say, a, almost a co-equal main character to her husband, Gideon Stoltz, the sheriff, True has taken the death of her child quite uh, deeply. And it is, it is really, um, it really bothered her and, and sent her into, into a depression. But there's a lot of evidence that that was often not the case, that folks, you know, kind of accepted the fact that it was, it was, it was fairly likely that their children could die, uh, you know, of one childhood disease or, or one disease or another. And people, the same, same thing with people. Like, for instance, at that time, again, before germ theory was, was recognized, tuberculosis killed thousands upon thousands of people. So no particular significance, I think, in the deaths of these children other than that it was something that happened. Okay. Uh, are there parts of your mysteries that you, uh, that you especially enjoy writing about? Yeah, I really like writing action scenes, um, fight scenes. Um, not that I'm a fighter myself at all, but um, I, I do. I do enjoy the the uh, kind of analyzing a, a a scene or an incident and figuring out, okay, how am I going to write this? And you know, often slowing down the prose and making the sentences shorter will convey a real sense of of action and, and something that is happening, you know, in in the in the moment. Um, so I like writing about. Uh, I like writing about horseback riding too, and the behavior of horses. And of course, horses were how people got around back then. You had you either rode a horse or you got around on shank's mare, uh, which is the way of saying you walked. Um, so I, I, I'm a rider myself, I'm an equestrian. I'm probably about an hour and 15 minutes from now, I will be on a horse here in Vermont. I ride several hundred times a year uh, with my wife, Nancy Brown. We have uh, four horses. 
so we get out quite a lot. Um, so I enjoy writing writing about writing, as you probably could uh, guess from the uh, sample that I read, the, the scene where True is, is needing to get on a horse and is not necessarily behaving as well as she would like him to. Well, I'm sure your horses are better behaved. No, not necessarily. <laughs> Some of them are, sometimes they are. Uh, what, what other things in the book that you think people would be interested in that they may not know just from, you know, from, uh, from your talk now or, you know, or, or just picking up, picking up the book and glancing through it? You know, I would just say the way people lived at that time, how difficult it was to get from one place to another. Um, when Sheriff Gideon Stoltz has to go to uh, a valley 12 miles from the town of Adamant, it's likely that he's going to stay there for a night or two because you'd be asking an awful lot to try to get your horse to go 12 miles, including over a mountain, and then turn around and come back on the same day. So travel was, was difficult. Um, there was a stage route that went from uh, Lewistown in, through the Seven Mountains to Belfont in the early part of the 19th century. And, and so I've, I've, I've worked that into the story too in a, in a few places. So the roads were, were very poor. Very often they, had, they consisted of um, dirt tracks with stumps that had been cut off just below wagon axle height. Um, so, you know, details like that, I tried to, I tried to research and then put into the story. And that's what makes historical fiction, I think, interesting. Certainly it's what makes me want to read historical mysteries because I can find out about, you know, like I referred to earlier with the Inspector Yashim mysteries, what was it like for, uh, a, a eunuch to live in the in 19th century Constantinople? So these little details, these these uh, these facts that you know you don't want them to get in the way of the story. The story is still the main thing, uh, but the details add interest, I think, and, and make for a good read. Can you talk about the your, your writing process? Uh, do you have a time for writing? Do you have a system? You know, uh, how, how do you write? Well, I have a job too. I work as a consultant for the Wildlife Management Institute, and that's a non-governmental organization. So sometimes um, that takes over my time. But in generally, what in general, what I will do is I'll I'll get up in the morning and I'll make myself a a big mug of very strong coffee, and I'll try to write in the morning. Uh, and I write almost every day. I wrote. This is, but this is Sunday. I wrote 250 words this morning. So that's a one page. Um, you know, and if you write one page a day, you'll write a book in a year, that's for sure. Um, so that's what I try to do. I try to work in the morning on my writing. And then uh, at noon, my wife and I always take a hike with our dog. And then I'll come back in the afternoon and, and work some more if, I, if I'm on a roll. Um, I like to sometimes stop in the middle of a scene rather than at the end of a scene so that I sit down and start writing. You know, I read what I've written and then take up right where I've ended. And I don't, you know, it, it's better to do that for me than to stop at the end of a chapter and just, you know, have to go back and get started again. And I'm sorry, why do you do that? Uh, just so that I have continuity, you know, so that I can, um, so that I, I can read through the paragraph, you know, maybe come to the end of the paragraph, but the chapter's not over yet, so there's more action to come. And it just it just keeps me from stopping on a place where it makes it more difficult to get started again uh, the next time I sit down with the manuscript. So is most of your writing these days uh, uh, fiction uh, in, in, instead of, uh, you know, some of your books, your nonfiction uh, nature and wildlife books? Yeah, and I, and I hope to... I would really like to keep going with the Gideon Stoltz series. Um, the uh, I want to I want to write. That's what I really like to to write. I, I I find that I read fiction 
almost completely, except when I'm doing research and then I read nonfiction. So I want to, I find myself wanting to write that which I love to read. So one, one thing that I, that I would, um, would mention is that folks can learn a lot more about uh, me and some of the things that I do and my horseback riding and some of my other activities if they go on my website. So all you have to do is search on my name and then you'll get my website. And I also have an email newsletter that I've just started. Uh, I just started it last month in March, but I'll be, uh, I'll be writing short pieces about uh, a lot of the things we've talked about today that, you know, things that came up as a result of some of your questions for, um, I'll be, I'll be writing uh, email newsletters twice a month. And then some of them, many of them will actually link to longer blog posts on the same subject. All right, great. We look forward to that. Uh, well, I just have one more question, uh, if, in, in, unless anyone else uh, has a question and, and again, jump in. Uh, but uh, what did you think uh, is the contribution of, of, of Nighthawk's wings to, to, to the genre? The genre being uh, mysteries or thrillers. Yeah. yeah, I would say that um, maybe the largest contribution is the uh, portrayal of women in the 1800s and the, the difficulty, um, difficulties that they faced. I mean, men faced difficulties too, but it was particularly difficult for women because there were many social strictures in place and uh, as I mentioned earlier, a woman couldn't um, own property, for instance. A husband could sell a wife's clothing if he wanted to, you know. The, I don't know that I put that into the, into the novel, but I think that, that you do get a sense in the novel of, of where women were expected to be in society at that time. And, um, they were not allowed to vote. You know, they were not even encouraged to think about the, those sorts of matters like politics. And in the next Gideon Stoltz mystery, uh, having to do with um, runaway slaves, my main character's wife, True, will be um, playing an even greater role. And I see that Sue Kellerman has asked, will there be a True Burns series in the future? Gee, that's a great idea. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe, you know, that's one thing I have to face too. Um, if I stay true to history, Gideon Stoltz was only allowed as a Pennsylvania sheriff, a county sheriff, to serve uh, one consecutive or one three-year term. So after he served as sheriff for three years, he's out. What does Gideon do then? I don't, I don't think that True would be allowed to run for sheriff because like I said, there are many restrictions on women, and that would have been one of them. But um, that's a, it's an interesting idea. You know, what, where do we go from there? And I think we have a question from the uh, the Smiths. One of the Smiths. Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, how have people reacted to your your two mystery novels, and are the reactions different from men and women? That's a great question. Um, as it happens, most of the readers of mysteries are women. Um, and in fact, most of the people who buy books are women. They're a majority of people. Um, and I will say that the women who have read Nighthawk's Wing, those who have, have talked to me about it have thought it was a very revealing mystery and, um, and they liked it a great deal. So I think that they, I think that the, my attempt to write about women in the early 1800s was successful. I think it, it, it struck a chord with, with readers. Uh, yes, Roger. Unmuted. Yes, yeah. thank you for it. Uh, Chuck, as my ever faltering memory goes. I recall that you once worked as a science writer at Penn State, and uh, a lot of your work was in science writing, nature writing. What 
initially kindled the flame, what attracted you to uh, the genre in which you find yourself now uh, greatly ensconced? What, be what, what, be happy what, to... what, what triggered it? Well, I would just, I would just say that I found, I found myself reading a lot of uh, mysteries and thrillers just because I enjoyed reading them. And at one point I asked, I said to myself, can I write that kind of a book? And in a way, I wrote A Stranger Here Below first. That's the first mystery. Right, right. I almost did it as a lark. You know, can I write a mystery? And uh, a little bit of an interesting story behind A Stranger Here Below is that it has in it, uh, it's sort of two mysteries. One is a one is a mystery that's told in the journal of a judge who has committed suicide. And this judge was my main character, Gideon's mentor. But anyway, the judge keeps a journal about a, a case uh, on which he had to rule as a judge 30 years ago. And that, that case I actually drew from a book that my wife, Nancy Brown, found at the AAUW book sale. And it, it was a it was a, a book set in Denmark. Um, let me see if I can recall it. I can find it quickly. What the name of it was? It was called "The Parson at Vileby," and it was a Danish folk tale that um, was uh, actually from the 1600s. And so I used it as an interior plot on a stranger here below. And it made it a somewhat more complex mystery than some, but um, anyway, I was able to to write the novel and uh, I was able to find an, an agent and then the agent was able to place it with a publisher. And so I succeeded with the first one and publishers like to have about one mystery a year in a series. So that's my goal. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm off on a new career path here and um, I hope it uh, I hope it continues more power to you thanks thanks Roger good seeing you good seeing you uh, Charles thanks so much for joining us this is this has been terrific uh, I think we, we we've really enjoyed uh, hearing from you and hearing you read from your book and and, and answering our questions uh, best of luck uh, with the book and uh, and in the new books you're writing so uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, and Mary. Ford, you I would, yes, I would just like to ask if there are any other questions. I think there might be a couple of questions that we didn't tackle here. Um, one is um, in a stranger here below. Um, it, a town is mentioned with a very long name that starts with the C. Where is that? Oh, Clamus. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I had a hard time hearing you. I think you're. Your, your uh, mic is not oh, the best. Oh, it's probably behind the, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. But I think you, the question, if I'm right, was what was Chinkla Clamus? Mm -hmm. And Chinkla Clamus was actually the original name for Clearfield, Pennsylvania. Oh. So anyone who knows the history of the central part of Pennsylvania might pick up on that. Yeah. yeah. And um, if there are any other questions that we didn't catch, um, uh, please feel free. I would just like to say thank you to everyone for uh, attending and it's really wonderful. If you feel like it, you can um, show your video and I can get a, get a glimpse of all the folks who are here. Yeah, that would be fine. And I, and I can actually put it on um, gallery uh, view for our YouTube too. It uh, looks like we have one other question. Um, uh, what, yeah. what compelled you to move from Pennsylvania to Vermont? Um, Interstate 99. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything else? <laughs> well, this part of this part of the world, I came up here one time and went grouse hunting with a friend of mine who lived in this area. And um, honestly, it actually reminded me a bit of central Pennsylvania when I was growing up. Mm. So a, a great mix of, of uh, agricultural land and mountains, um, agricultural land and forest, or yeah, and forest. And 
Uh, land was cheap up here. So we have a 120 acre farm that we were able to buy. Um, and uh, riding opportunities are terrific. And my, both my wife and I like winter. So we have opportunities to go snowshoeing and cross country skiing. And um, it's been a good move. I, I, I miss, you know, I certainly miss central Pennsylvania and I come back when I can, uh, but we're, we're very happy to be up here. Well, that's great. Well, again, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, maybe we can give uh, Charles a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. And, uh, and thank you so much, Charles. We really enjoyed that. And, and, um, and I also just wanted to thank everybody that uh, was able to attend today. And uh, we certainly would invite you to, to be a member. Um, visit centerhistory.org if you'd like to have a little bit more information about us. And, and um, if you're not receiving our email communications, you can also sign up for our email on our website. And, um, and we wish you a, a great a great week. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>